Chapter 19 I Find a Gold Mine While I was with the Apaches, Carnaviste decided to seek a new country. We were at that time in the mountains of New Mexico, the Guadalupe Range it must have been. That region was getting pretty well crowded with Indians because so many of the Apaches hadn't been pushed back by the encroaching civilization. Carnaviste sent me and two Indians, Essacona and Pinero, to seek a new country far to the northwest. We started out in a southwesterly direction at first and went into Old Mexico, where we did not find anything to suit us. After traveling many days, our horses gave out and we stole fresh horses from Mexicans and took a northwestern course toward what I suppose is now Arizona. We captured a couple of burros and took them along to use in case our horses gave out, and in the event we could not find game, we intended to kill and eat them. We came to a spring at the foot of a sloping mountain where grass was good and game was abundant, and there we camped for several days. Our horses had become jaded and tender-footed, and we decided to leave them there until we returned. So starting out afoot and driving the two burrows, laden with a good supply of venison and water skins full of water, we headed for an unknown region that we had heard of, but which none of our tribes had ever seen. We traveled along leisurely for several days, going due west until we came to a barren desert region, wholly devoid of vegetation and water, just a stretch of white sand for miles and miles. We'd have found water before going onto this desert, and we filled our water skins and prepared for a long journey across that uninviting wilderness. We plodded along for days. The only thing to break the monotony was the fierce sandstorms, which would occasionally sweep along, blinding us and almost covering us and impeding our travel. On the sixth day, far in the distance, we discerned a chain of blue mountains, which at first we took to be a low-lying cloud. We pushed on, and as we went forward, the mountains began to take form and shape, and we knew that if we could hold out we could reach them within another week at the rate we were traveling, our speed being necessarily slow because our two pack burrows were beginning to suffer for forage and water. Our water supply was just about exhausted, and we realized that if we did not reach those mountains, we would perish there on that desert with our faithful burrows. At last we reached the foot of those mountains on the fifteenth day after starting across the desert. And so near exhausted were we that I believe if we had not reached there when we did, we could not have held out another day. Going up a canyon a short distance, we found a fine spring and an abundance of grass, and right there we stopped to rest for several days before penetrating those mountains. When we had rested for a reasonable time, we pushed on and traveled leisurely into the very heart of one of the most beautiful regions I have ever seen. Game was in superabundance, black-tailed deer, bear, lions, panthers, and other wild game were to be seen everywhere, and would not run when we approached. While we were prospecting in those mountains and happy in their solitude, we found a peculiar formation which arrested our attention, and we wondered at its grandeur. Near the top of a high mountain a kind of tableland had been formed, and from this tableland there was a sheer bluff or wall over which water poured when it rained, forming a basin many feet below. The wall over which this water flowed was worn smooth by the water's fall, and was of peculiar blue rock formation. In the basin below we found a storage of clear water which had a mineral taste, and which we were afraid to use, for Pinero said it might be a poison. In this basin we found the same kind of blue formation, and throughout the whole formation were outcroppings of bright yellow ore, which was in layers an inch or two in thickness and easily removed. Panera and Essacona suggested that we get some of those pretty yellow and blue rocks to take to the squaws, and with our scalping knives we dug out a number of large pieces of the yellow stuff and put it in our packs and carried it away with us. I had several pieces of it four or five inches long and two or three inches in thickness. We noticed it was very heavy, while the blue rocks were rather light and full of pores. We had no idea what the stuff was, as we were all three just young Indian cubs and not versed in mineralogy. But when we got back to our village, Carnaviste told us, when we showed him the pretty rocks, that it was gold, and that very thing kept our people from going into those mountains to establish our headquarters. Carnaviste said we would not be safe there, for where there was gold to be found, the white man would hunt for it, and we were seeking a region where the white man would not come. After spending one moon or a month in those mountains, killing game, and selecting a location for our villages, when the tribe was brought there, 
We took up the weary march across the wide desert and finally reached the former camping ground where we had left our horses, and we found them fat and in good condition. And after resting there a few days, we set out for our headquarters, reaching there in due time and reporting to Carnaviste that we had found an earthly happy hunting grounds, where the great spirit dwelt in every canyon, and where his smile kissed every mountain top at sunrise each morning. Carnaviste granted his satisfaction and delight, but when we showed him the pretty rocks we had brought back with us, he sorrowfully shook his head and said that that inviting region was not for the Indian, that it would prove a delusion and a snare, and if we went there, it would only increase our troubles, and we gave up all hope of ever finding a land where the white man would not come. Chapter 20 Capture a Herd of Cattle One time a party of Mexicans came to our camp to trade with the Indians. They had plenty of mezcal, corn, whiskey, and tobacco, and most of the tribe got drunk. One hundred and forty of the Indians and sixty of the Mexicans went on a cattle raid, and west of Fort Griffin, on the old trail, we ran into a big herd being driven to Kansas. There were about twenty cowboys with the cattle, and we rushed up and opened a fire. The cattle stampeded, and the cowboys rode in an opposite direction. There were enough of us to surround the cattle, and some to chase the cowboys but they were not overtaken. The second day, we were overtaken by about 40 white men who tried to retake the cattle, and in the attempt, two Mexicans and one Indian were killed. The Indian shot through the neck, and we had four horses killed. We repulsed them and got possession of two of their dead, were promptly scalped. I do not know what other losses they sustained. We went on southwest with the herd and had over a thousand head when we reached the village. These we traded to Mexicans and immediately stampeded them. I remember one of these cattle were branded hay. The scalp of the two cowboys were put on high poles and we had a big feast and war dance. We killed about 40 of the beeves and roasted them. We kept up a chant and dance around those scalps all night. More Mexicans had come and replenished our stock of whiskey. We had a little disagreement, and in order to settle the ruckus satisfactorily to all concerned, we killed two Mexicans and raised their scalps on a pole. We drank all the whiskey, sobered up, ran off the Mexicans, and kept all their trinkets, guns, ammunition, etc. But they got most of the cattle, which was more than pay. Then we repented over the Mexican affair and hired them to make friends. We moved our village away out to the sandy hills and spent some time hunting. There we found deer, antelope, javelinas, and some few buffalo. I have often been asked how we made the flint stone arrow spikes, and I will here endeavor to explain the process. We threw a large flint stone from two to six feet in circumference into the fire. After the stone became very hot, small thin pieces would pop off. We selected those pieces which would require the least work to put into shape, and picked these hot pieces up with the stick split at the end. With these pieces, while these pieces were very hot, we dropped cold water on those places we wished to thin down. The cold water caused the spot touch to chip off, and in this way we made some of the keenest pointed and sharpest arrows that could be fashioned out of stone. Many of these arrows in perfect shape can still be picked up in certain places all over Texas. We sharpened our arrow spikes, mended our bows, and brightened up our guns. Our arrows were made of a straight dogwood withe, with a feathered groove in one end and a flint rock or steel spike on the other. We first used flint rocks or spikes, also flint rock knives, which were used to skin buffalo and other animals. Later, when the soldiers began to come onto the plains, we found old barrel hoops and other steel around their camp, and from this steel we made steel arrow spikes and discarded our old flint rock spikes. The Mexican furnished us files with which to fashion and sharpen our arrows. For bowstrings, we used sinew taken from tender loin of a beef or deer. In a separate quiver, we carried a few poisoned arrows to use in battle. The venom of the rattlesnake was used on these spikes. We started out south to make another raid on the whites. And the first thing that broke the monotony of the raid and stirred up a little local interest was several men near the Concho River. We had a fierce fight with them and lost three of our braves. We put some sticks up in a big live oak tree laid the dead up there so the wolves would not eat them, and covered them with blankets. All of their guns, arrows, and trinkets were wrapped up with them, and their horses led under the tree and shot. 
so the Indians would be mounted and equipped when they reached the happy hunting grounds. I do not know what loss the white men sustained, but we had no means of finding out. We traveled southeast to another river and spied a man walking round and round. The Indians crawled up, waylaid him, and sent an arrow right through his breast. He stood there and spit up blood. The Indians let him suffer a little while and then dispatched him and carried along his scalp. This man must have been lost, for he had nothing with which to fight, but he had some rusty knives and bundles that looked somewhat worsted from the weather. Keeping our course, we came upon some men working in a rock quarry. One man was guarding the camp. We surrounded them and fired twice at the guard, and he ran and hid in the chaparral. The workmen made their escape through the thick undergrowth, and we took possession of the camp, where we found only one horse, five forty-four caliber rimfire Winchesters, with belts full of cartridges, sugar, flour, salt, and other things necessary for camp life. We destroyed everything we could not carry along. We went south from there, as well as I remember, and saw some children playing in a field near a house. We slipped up close and made a run at the children, and Snapping Turtle, a Kiowa, grabbed at one child as he ran through the fence. A white man came out with a Winchester and shot Snapping Turtle through the knee. We fought there for about two hours and tried to get revenge, but the man was brave and cautious, and we never got a fair shot at him. There were cattle near the house which bore a brand resembling a broad axe or hatchet, but we did not want cattle. We wanted blood. We went on a little further and rounded up nine good horses. We sent these, the wounded Indian, and two companions back to the village. Further on we discovered a man making rails. When we rushed at him he threw down his axe and lit out for his horse, which was tied to a tree. He hastily mounted the animal and forgot to untie him. He spurred the horse into a run, and when he reached the end of the stake rope, the sudden stop caused the horse and rider to turn a flip. The man got up running and made his escape, while we got the horse, a little sorrel pony. We rode up the hill and captured twelve horses, a big bay mule, and a light sorrel mule. We then started for home by way of Kickapoo Springs, and there we made ourselves the present of a nice drove of fat ponies. But our scouts informed us that the hateful rangers were on our trail. We dreaded those fellows, so we made for the plains and traveled three days and nights without eating or sleeping. We well knew how sleepless and restless those rangers were, and how unerring their aim when they got in a good shot, so we outrode them. On the fourth day we came upon a big old fat jackass some Mexicans had set free, so we butchered, roasted, and ate him. He was very palatable after our three days fast. We rested there and grazed our horses. Two days later we killed and ate a mustang. We thought we were out of danger, so we became a bit careless. We had started at daylight that morning, and about an hour and a half by the sun, the rangers unexpectedly came upon us from the east. The chief ordered us to stand and fight, saying there was no hope in flight. Chapter 21 Fight with the Rangers I learned, after my return to civilization, that this party of rangers was commanded by the famous scout and Indian fighter, Captain Dan W. Roberts, who at this writing, May 27, 1927, is still living at Austin, Texas. In spite of the orders of our chief, when the fight started our men scattered, and only four of us remained to fight the trained rangers. Some of the ranger force followed a retreating Indian whose horse's leg was broken by a shot, and he jumped up behind Makawish, a Lipan who was with our party, and they ran away. The fleeing Indians carried our rimfire Winchesters with them. Another Indian, a brother to my chief, was unhorsed, and he ran west. I rode up beside him, and he jumped up behind me, and we made for our comrades, but the rangers were too quick for us and cut us off, and those who were after Makawish and his companion turned on us placing us between two fires. Nestesina was the name of the warrior behind me. He protected us on one side with his shield, and I held my shield on the other. I directed my arrows to those in front, and he sent his shots backwards. Several bolts hit my shield and knocked it against my forehead, each stroke raising a bump, and I could hear them fairly raining on Nestesina's shield. In a few moments, my horse was shot down, and he fell on me. Nestesino had broken his bow, 
so he seized mine and ran for life. I implored him not to leave me, but he heeded not my entreaties in his mad scramble for life. I was pinned underneath the dead horse, and it seemed as if I would have had to stay there and accept my fate, whatever it might be. I lay perfectly still when two or three rangers dashed up, and one of them pointed his gun at me, and I thought my time had come. I closed my eyes, and there was a loud report, and it seemed to me I felt a bullet graze my temple. Two rangers began talking, and opening my eyes, I saw they were looking at me from their actions. They must have discovered I was not an Indian. They both dashed away after news to Sino, and I could hear them firing at him. I listened to the fire until I thought they were out of sight, and then I scrambled out from under my fallen horse and crawled some distance on my belly and hid in the grass. After a little while, the rangers came back to look for me. I could hear them ride about and talk, and for a time they were quite near me. I lay still in a slight depression with the high grass pretty well covering me, hardly daring to breathe for fear they would find me there. They stayed on the battleground and searched for an hour or more, and finally left, going east. I remained in my hiding place until they were entirely out of sight, then I raised up, arose, and cautiously surveyed my surroundings. I went to my dead horse, but all of my weapons had been taken, and I had nothing with which to supply myself with food. My comrades were all gone, either killed or flown. I went to where Nusk Dixino was killed and came upon his corpse. About 600 yards from where we were dismounted to fight. He had been scalped and I thought skinned from all appearances and all of his weapons taken. I viewed this weird spectacle a few seconds and turned and ran until I fell breathless and exhausted to the ground. We had with us at the beginning of this battle a little Mexican boy and when the rangers came near he quit the Indians and ran towards them with uplifted arms. They carried him away with them. After resting and collecting my wits, I realized that I was a long distance from my Indian headquarters, about 300 miles. There I was with nothing on but a buckskin jacket and no way of providing myself with food. I started on the Indian trail, walking day and night, subsisting on grasshoppers, lizards, bugs, roots, and anything that I could find. I nearly starved for water. Finally, I came to a small cave that contained water, but how to get it out was a problem. But I was so near starved I did not consider, so I crowded down into that cave ahead foremost, and by desperate effort squeezed myself between the rocks until I reached the water. After drinking my fill I found that I was fastened, and came very near drowning before I could get out of that tight place. I kept kicking and scrambling backwards until I succeeded in reaching the top. I tramped wearily on, following the trail until I came to where the Indians had killed an antelope. The wolves had eaten all of the flesh that was left, but I sucked the bones and gnawed on the hide for nourishment. I ate prickly pear, and one day I was so nearly starved for water that I ate dirt where a mud hole had been formed by recent rain. I became in a measure delirious, and when I came to my senses I was at a spring. I drank copiously, but I had starved so long the water would not stay on my stomach. I lay around there bathing my parched tongue in the water until I could drink a little. I stayed there that day and night. I was too weak and sore and faint to feel much pain. My sensibilities were dulled, and the anguish of homesickness never bothered me. I recruited and recuperated there, catching a few frogs, which I ate raw, and considered them dainty morsels. I was loath to leave because I had nothing in which to carry water. I knew I could not remain there very long, so I went on and finally reached the village. And when I got there, my toenails came off, and I was sick for a long, long time. Those Indians who ran when the rangers came up had reached the village some days before I arrived, and had told that we were killed, and that they had killed our horses and buried all our property with us. They told the chief of how I had turned back and had taken his brother, Nustacino, up behind me in an attempt to aid his escape, and great was the lamentation over our reported death. When I reached the village, they were overjoyed to see me, and when I told how my three companions and myself had been forsaken by the others, the chief's anger knew no bounds. He made me a chief over all those who had deserted me, and I felt doubly repaid for all my sufferings. They treated me kindly, made me a good comfortable bed, cooked my food nicely, and showed me every consideration. In order to make my honor complete, I told the tribe that I followed the rangers and buried Nistacino, 
with his face downward and covered his last resting place with rocks so that the wolves or other wild beasts could not get him. My, how they had shot that Indian. He was butchered terribly. There was no face on it which to turn him. I can see that bloody form yet when I could hover my eyes. After I got well, I could go ahead of a good many grown Indians. I could wear red strings and beads and lead the fight, and I was anxious to try my skill and bravery, but I was compelled to stay in camp nearly two months. We moved every few days to better hunting grounds and killed much game. Antelope were plentiful. The first thing we did when we killed one was go into the paunch and eat what we found there, then his heart and liver. We often feasted on wood rats, polecats, and opossums. We moved across the Rio Grande into the mountains of Mexico, and there we killed bear, black-tailed deer, and jay finnas. The Indians have a system of enumeration of their own, of which the human hand is the basis. They count upon the fingers until five is reached, when they denote the number by a hand. Six is a hand and a finger, and then becomes two hands, but when twenty is reached, a new name is used. Twenty is denoted by a man, and forty by two men. Forty-five would thus be two men and a hand, and forty-six, two men, a hand, and first finger, etc. Before closing this chapter, I want to refer again to the fight we had with the rangers. Captain J.B. Gillett, who lives at Marfa, Texas, was in Captain D.W. Roberts' ranger company when they caught us on the Concho Plains and engaged us in battle. In telling of the fight in this book, in telling of the fight in his book, Six Years with the Texas Rangers, first edition, Captain Gilt mentions a white boy with the Indians whom he calls Fisher. I am the white boy he refers to, but he evidently had in mind a Rudolph Fisher, who was captured in Gillespie County a year before my capture. As Captain Roberts in his book, Rangers and Sovereignty, also calls me Fisher. It is natural that Captain Gillett would make the same mistake. Fisher was captured by the Comanches, is still a member of that tribe, and now fives near Apache, Oklahoma. I was captured by the Apache, and was with them in the fight mentioned. Captain Roberts and Captain Gillette both say the Indians they fought were Lipans, but I know they were Apaches, for I was with them. If they were Lipans, how came Fisher with them? These mistakes often occur in recording history and cannot be avoided. Captain Gillette mentions a Mexican boy the rangers recaptured in this fight who was stolen in the Uvalde country. The boy had been with the Indians only a short time when the rangers got him and had not learned to speak the Apache language very well. I was present in camp when the Apaches returned from a raid down into southwest Texas and brought him in. He was taken along with our raiding party to wait on old Chinava, a brave Apache warrior. Rudolf Fischer was a German boy and was captured near Fredericksburg in 1869, I think, about a year before the Indians got me. He was adopted into the Comanche tribe, and after being with them about ten years, he was brought back to his people near Fredericksburg, but he had become so thoroughly Indianized that he was not content to remain and resume the white man's ways, and after spending about a year with his parents, he returned to the Comanches, where he had a squaw and a child, and now lives on his headlight in Oklahoma. Fisher became a very brave warrior and is held in high esteem by the tribe. I talked with Captain Roberts at my home in Loyal Valley in 1881, after I was brought back from captivity, and we talked about the fight. He evidently forgot my name, and having Fisher in mind, he wrote it that way in his book.